All right. Um, uh, I will be returning your papers to you on Thursday. There, uh, I was hoping to do it today, but there's still a handful of papers that haven't been graded. Uh, but you will uh, unquestionably get them back on, on Thursday, right, at the end of class. Uh, so uh, for today, uh, what I want to do is I want to start with some remarks uh, on uh, the political economy um, of India under colonial rule, something that we've spoken about uh, before, but I want to more or less uh, uh, you know, finish up with that segment, uh, have a short discussion of these uh, two short pieces by Marx, um, and from there then move on to uh, 1857, the rebellion of 1857-58, which uh, will in a way bring us to the last uh, segment of the course, because uh, uh, once uh, the uh, rebellion is crushed in uh, uh, 1858, in early 1858, moving into the summer of 1858, uh, the company is going to be abolished. Uh, the legal abolition of the company doesn't take place actually until uh, about, I think, 1870 or so. But, uh, but effectively, the company is finished uh, in 1858, and India is going to become a crown colony. Uh, and from that, then we will ob obviously move into uh, the segment having to do with uh, resistance to colonial rule uh, after an interlude of about three to four decades. Uh, that's the period from 1858 to roughly around 1890. Um, and we'll spend a little bit of time on that period trying to understand what exactly was happening in India before the advent of nationalism, particularly mass nationalism. Now, uh, on the question of political economy, uh, one of the things I'd mentioned to you at the outset uh, of this class when I was actually introducing the syllabus, uh, and there's been occasion for me to mention it again after that, uh, and that is the fact that India, uh, which was a country that, uh, let's say circa 1750, you might recall some of you, my comments uh, about the world situation roughly around 1750, and the world situation was that uh, India, China, and Europe were the three largest blocks. Okay, uh, and India accounted for you know somewhere between let's say 22 to 24, maybe 25 percent of the total world manufacturing output in 1750. Uh, uh, in 1800, it still accounted. In 1800, for approximately 20 percent. So these figures, if you want to verify the figures, you just look up the Habib book, the reading that has been assigned to you from the Irfan Habib book. Uh, there are many other works that mention these figures as well. Uh, so he, he gives a figure of 19.7%. Uh, that's the world, uh, that's India's share of the world manufacturing output. Uh, in 1860, this had declined to 8.6%. And in 1913, it had declined to 1.4%. All right? So that's the trajectory that you have to really begin with. And now within that, there is an array of facts. The Habib reading is full of them. Don't, uh, don't get bewildered by it. Just let's concentrate on uh, three or four uh, critical elements of this economic picture. Okay? Um, now, Britain is by far India's largest trading partner. Okay? Uh, so if you look at the Habib work, uh, page 35, um, I'm talking about the book called Indian Economy, 1858 to 1914. So on page 35 of this, he actually gives you a table, table 2.6, uh, and uh, shows that between 1849 to 1910, so he's looking at a, uh, at a period of about 65 years, uh, uh, India, uh, uh, the bulk of India's trading is with Britain, both exports and imports. Okay, um, and if you look at the, uh, 1869, 1870, during that period, that one year, uh, the percentage share in India's total exports that Britain accounted for was approximately 52 percent. So, so, you know, you can see that Britain is not only India's largest trading partner; it actually accounts for the for the bulk of it. All right, uh, and the percentage share in India's total imports which is even more significant because what's happening is that you've got goods now coming from, from Britain flowing into India. Uh, India receives 70% of all of its imports from Britain, 70%. Uh, there are years, 1889-90, when 73.15%. So that's roughly three quarters of all of India's imports are coming from one single country. And just to give you a sense, 
Uh, it's, it's a kind of figure that I think Habib could have given, just to make it a bit more telling. If you look today at who are India's largest trading partners, Britain does not even figure in the top 15. Not even in the top 15. Countries such as Switzerland account for a larger share of India's total exports and imports than does Great Britain. Okay? So you can see, obviously, that the conditions of colonialism, among other things, imposed these constraints that Britain became now the largest partner for India. Okay? Now, before 1800, India was the largest producer of cotton and cotton textiles in the world before 1800. And of course, what's going to happen is you're going to have this flow. I mean, if you read uh, uh, Marx, uh, not just the short pieces that you have here, but if you look at Capital, Volume 1, and a number of other works, uh, Marx himself actually gives you a number of figures. And these figures are intended to convey the argument that India is going to become, under colonial rule, the largest importer of cotton textiles in the world, from having, become the, for, from having been the largest producer and exporter before 1800. Okay, so let me move to Marx since we're on this subject and start looking at the piece. Uh, it's a piece which is obviously not just about cotton textiles. In fact, that just figures in a paragraph or two. Uh, and the two pieces I'm talking about are called the British Rule in India, and a piece called the Further Results of British Rule in India. Uh, I'm using a, a edition which is slightly different than the one than than the one that you have, but. But uh, uh, it's, it's the same text, it's just the pagination is a little bit different, and there may be a few uh, changes in the wording, right? Um, so these are dispatches that were written by Marx. Uh, the British rule in India is written in 1853. This is before the rebellion of 1857. He is going to write on the rebellion as well, as you know, all right? And how does he begin this piece? Uh, he says that Hindustan is an Italy of Asiatic dimensions. Now, one of the things that, of course, a European writer has to do is he has to make his European audience, and when I say European here, I'm speaking about Euro-American at this point in time, has to make his audience feel comfortable with the facts of geography. Right? He's describing a country that is really not known to most people in the world, uh, certainly not Europeans and most Americans. So he says Hindustan is an Italy of Asiatic dimensions, the Himalayas for the Alps, the plains of Bengal for the plains of Lombardy, etc., etc., Right? Uh, and then he speaks about the fact that there you've got the same dismemberment in the political configuration. Remember that this is before Italian unification. Right? Uh, at this point in time, you don't, really, you don't have a unified state uh, in Italy. So he's really speaking about the disunity of India, that this has been the condition of India for a very long period of time. I share not the opinion, he continues, of those who believe in a golden age of Hindustan. Right? So he has clearly allied himself here with the positivist camp of the Orientalists, if, if we could use that template for a minute, right? because he's saying that, well, I, I don't really believe in this I idea that there was this golden age of Indian history. You know? And he's arguing here against, obviously, the likes of Sir William Jones, right? um, or people like, perhaps, possibly people like John Malcolm. Uh, I share not the opinion of those who believe in a golden age of Hindustan. All right. Uh, they cannot, however, remain any doubt but that the misery inflicted by the British on Hindustan. So he immediately moves at, at, in the next paragraph to say that, well, colonial rule has imposed a certain kind of misery on the people of India. Right? They cannot be doubt that the misery inflicted by the British on Hindustan is of an essentially different and infinitely more intensive kind than all Hindustan had to suffer before. Right? And why is it more intense? Why is it of a different kind? So he's going to now try to suggest some of the reasons for that, but you can infer some of the reasons. Some of the reasons have to do with the fact that obviously the machinery of oppression in the 18th and 19th century is much more advanced. And when I say the machinery of oppression, I'm talking about the fact that modern states obviously have means of oppression which were not available to pre-modern states. I mean, you look at the Holocaust, for example, okay, in our own, you know, in comparatively recent times, right, 20th century, I mean, the kind of social engineering that was required to undertake something like the Holocaust is enormous. It's something that you simply could not have done. Now, you could have dispatched thousands of people to their, to their death, 
you know, that's what Nader Shah does in 1739 when he invades India. This is what's happened historically in a huge number of places when invaders come, you know. And you put, you put the people you conquer under the sword. But this is, but what he's talking about is a different kind of social engineering that a modern or a relatively modern state in the 19th century is able to undertake. He says, I do not allude to European despotism planted upon Asiatic despotism. That's a crucial statement here because Marx is very much alive to the fact that the British may be claiming to bring the rule of law, ideas of justice, etc., etc., but he has no illusions about what's actually going on. That this is a European despotism, and what makes the situation really dire in India is the fact that this is planted upon an Asiatic despotism. Okay? So th this is what, what, in part, he's really referring to by the British East India Company, forming a more monstrous combination than any of the divine monsters startling us in the temple of Salset. Salset is a little island in uh, the west coast of India and Maharashtra. Okay? Right? So, so what he's doing is he's, he's disabusing the reader of this idea that, hey, what the British are really out to do is to bring the rule of law justice, all of that, right? But nonetheless, you know, the conclusions that he's going to reach are going to be quite startling, and that's what we're really interested in. So we're going to slowly move towards that. Uh, but let us first try to get some understanding of his characterization of Indian society. All the civil wars, invasions, revolutions, conquests, famines, strangely complex, rapid and destructive, as a successive action in Hindustan may appear, did not go deeper than its surface. England has broken down the entire framework of Indian society without any symptoms of reconstitution yet appearing. Right? So this is a social anomie. You, you, you recall our, my, my observations about what had happened after the conquest of Bengal in the 1750s. So then in 1770, you have this huge famine. Approximately 10 million people die. It's estimated between one-fourth through one-third of the population. Right? What Marx is talking about is precisely this. Namely, that the old social order has disappeared. A new social order has not yet really come into place. Okay? So, so civil wars, invasions, revolutions, conquests, famines, etc. Et England has broken down the entire framework of Indian society without any symptoms of reconstitution yet appearing. This loss of his old world with no gain of a new one imparts a particular kind of melancholy. You know, extraordinarily interesting argument here because he's saying that you, know, you can't really measure colonialism simply by the breakdown even of the old social order, the, the fact that a new political regime has come in, okay, that the British are interested in the plunder of India. It's a kind of melancholy that has now come into the country. Okay? And, you know, melancholy is, is a condition that is very difficult to diagnose. You know, if you had to look for, it's a word that, by the way, we don't use very much in English today, you know, uh, and most people would think of something called sadness when they're thinking of melancholy. But what he is describing is a kind of a, 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 a kind of a general feeling of extraordinary apathy, okay, that had now crept into India. This loss of his old word with no gain of a new one imparts a particular kind of melancholy to the present misery of the Hindu, right? And separates Hindustan, ruled by Britain. Notice, by the way, that he's thinking of India as a predominantly Hindu country, right? Predominantly Hindu country because he's speaking about the misery of the Hindu. He doesn't say the misery of the Indian or the misery of the Hindu, the Muslim, and the Sikh. Now, of the Hindu, and separates Hindustan, ruled by Britain, from all of its ancient traditions and from the whole of its past history. That something has been sundered, something has been cut loose completely. Okay? And then he describes the nature of the government that existed in India. Uh, and, and he gives the kind of arguments, by the way, that you know, I've been uh, again hinting at you know, despotism, the fact that the state was there essentially to conduct war. Um, why, did you need, uh, why did you need a state at all? You needed a state partly because you have large parts of, for example, Western India that are arid. You need irrigation. Only a very large kind of state can provide such works of irrigation. So this is what is called hydraulic despotism. Okay? And there are entire works that have been written on questions of this kind. 
Then from there he is going to move on once he has described the nature of the state in pre-colonial India, uh, then a brief description of the agriculture, uh, and of course you see all of these orientalist tropes that we have been talking about constantly in this class, you know, the idea of unchanging India. Let me give you an illustration of that. However changing the political aspect of India's past must appear, that is that one despot is replaced by another despot, right? To that extent India's politics does change. Right? However changing the political aspect of India's past must appear, its social condition has remained unaltered since its remotest antiquity. Since its remotest antiquity. The social condition of India has not changed for millennia. For millennia. Right? Unchanging India. That's the picture that I mentioned. You know, the, at the top, the desperate changes, the political regime changes, the base of Indian society remains completely unaltered. Yes? Oh, this is, uh, you, have to, you have to go to another, skip the next big paragraph and the paragraph beginning now the British in East India. That's the paragraph, okay, right? The hand loom and the spinning wheel producing the regular myriads of spinners and weavers were the pivots of the structure of that society. From immemorial times Europe received the admirable textures, okay, of Indian labor. So now he, he starts to talk about what is it that Europe was getting from India, sending in return for them her precious metals, right? So that's a trade that we have spoken about. Bullion going from Europe, right? And cotton textiles and of course a great many other things coming from India going to Europe. And furnishing thereby his materials to the goldsmith, that indispensable member of Indian society, etc. England began with driving the Indian cottons from the European market. It then introduced twist into Hindustan. This is cotton twist. And in the end, inundated, and in the end, inundated the very mother country of cotton with cottons. Right? So here's a country that was the king of cotton, the largest producer of cotton, raw cotton, and then cotton textiles, and now India is going to be inundated with cotton textiles from Britain. Yes. No, because 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 you have to remember the industrial revolution in Britain. So, so, so it's, you, you yes, but then it's cheaper to produce it there. But then, by the way, you put very high tariffs on imports. Yeah, right. Coming from Britain. So what what is it doing? What we are saying is that in fact Indians have to now buy textile at a relatively high price as well. Right. That's that's what he's really talking about here. So this is, this, is, as, this is, by the way, an aspect of what, what late 19th century Indian economists would call the drain theory, right? The uh, essential argument here is that India is being drained of its wealth. You know, so the most famous exponent of that is a man uh, called Rajni, uh, uh, Rajni, not Rajni Palme, that he's a, bit, a little bit later, Dada by Naroji, right, who writes a book called Poverty and Un-British Rule in India. Poverty and Un-British Rule in India. And essentially what he does is he puts forward this theory which I'm describing to you as a drain theory and the drain theory is that India is essentially drained or bled of its wealth. And then of course he gives you a huge amount of data including data from you know <coughs> cotton textiles, imports, so forth and so on. Right? Let me just finish this paragraph. From, 1830, from 1818 to 1836 the export of twist from Great Britain to India rose in the proportion of one to 5,200. Proportion of 1 to 5,200. In 1824, the export of British muslins, so muslins is again, a, it's a very, very fine kind of cotton, extremely fine. Okay, muslins to India hardly amounted to 1 million yards, while in 1837 it surpassed 64 millions of yards. But at the same time, the population of Dhaka decreased from 550,000 inhabitants to 20,000. Right, so one, what Marx is describing here, by the way, is now another phenomenon that Habib actually explains in his book, and that is a large shift of people from urban India to rural India. Okay, so what you have is that, and of course, one of the things, one of the consequences of that is that that when you have uh, the crowding of agriculture, it is going to lead to huge amount of distress in rural areas. So you know that indentured labor migration that I was speaking about to you, 
Remember from 18, beginning in the 1830s going all the way until the early part of the 20th century. Now this is largely coming from rural areas where you have a surplus of population now because Indian towns are being largely denuded of their population. And one of the reasons that's happening is that the urban areas, the urban handicrafts, for example, that existed are no longer really profitable. Okay? So that's the situation that he's describing. Ah, well, there, there are three or four complex trajectories here. One has to do with what happens to the population distribution in India. Okay, how does it gradually gravitate from a largely, from not, I should say, a largely from, from significant sized towns to smaller places? Okay, to rural areas. And this is what he means when he talks about the population of Dhaka decreasing. Dhaka, by the way, is today in, in Bangladesh. It's a, it's a capital of Bangladesh. Uh, today, incidentally, a population of well over 15 million. Okay? And the population of Dhaka decreasing from 150,000 inhabitants to 20,000. This decline of Indian towns, celebrated for their fabrics, was by no means the worst consequences, Marx. British steam and science uprooted over the whole surface of Hindustan the union between agriculture and manufacturing industry. Right? There is, by the way, another word that is used to describe what happens here. That is what is called deindustrialization. Deindustrialization. And one of the things that Irfan Habib argues in his, in his book is that, look, I mean, if you, you recall the figures that I'd given you about India's share of the world manufacturing output. Now, one of the problems, not with the figures, but with the interpretation of the figures is that you can assume that India's share of the world manufacturing output would have gone down even without colonial rule. Why can you assume that? Because under modern methods of industrial production, right, the share in the West would have gone up in any case. Right? The question here has to do with what percentage of this decline of India's share of the world manufacturing output has to do with the fact that to some extent you would have had an increase in Europe on account of, as I said, modern methods of industrial production. But some of it takes place on account of deindustrialization. And it's hard to put a figure there and say, well, this percentage was caused by deindustrialization and this percentage was caused by, by the fact that Europe itself is now witnessing an industrial revolution and therefore obviously there's going to be increased production over there. These two circumstances, Marx says, the Hindu on the one hand leaving like all oriental peoples to the central government the care of the great public works. That includes irrigation for example. The prime condition of his agriculture and commerce dispersed on the other hand over the surface of the country and agglomerated in small centers by the domestic union of agriculture and manufacturing pursuits. These two circumstances had brought about, since the remotest times, a social system of particular features, the so-called village system. So this is now another of those great orientalist ideas, that is that India is basically a cluster of village communities. India is a cluster of village communities. You've got tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these village communities, and these are largely autarkic. Autarkic meaning economically self-sufficient. Right? So this is what is called, by the way, the, the, the Jajmani system. So uh, if I had to give it to you in a, in a nutshell, the Jajmani system is that if you go to, according to this account of it, if you go to an Indian village, all right, so what do you find? You find you know, 15 people uh, uh, who are specialists in their own trade or their own profession. Right? So one person is a barber. The other person is a washerman. All right? The third person is a potter. The fourth is a cobbler. In the Jajmani system, you don't really need much cash because the cobbler goes to the barber, gets a haircut, the barber goes to the cobbler and gets his shoes fixed. Okay? Right? And simplifying it enormously. Right? What Marx is saying is that what you had in India was this autarkic system of self sufficient village communities, tens of thousands of them. Okay? And of course, to some extent, he is. Even though he is aware of the, of, of the fact that India was a large producer of cotton and cotton textiles and so on, I think that he gra greatly underestimates the extent to which there were extensive trading networks within India itself, for example. Okay? So, which is one reason why he's able to come up with this idea that what you have in India is a kind of a despotism. Indian society remains unaltered. At the bottom, what you have is this Jajmani system in thousands, tens of thousands of village communities. On the top, a despot comes, people don't really care who rules them. Right? 
that's the system that he's describing, essentially over here. Okay. And then if you, if you continue on, what he's really going to say here is, so what is it that England is really doing? What is it that England is really doing? What kind of social transformation? That's the last couple of pages that we want to look at. Uh, is it really producing? Okay. So he says, English interference, having placed the spinner in Lancashire and the weaver in Bengal, or sweeping away both Hindu spinner and weaver, dissolved. L listen to this phrasing by him. Okay, These are his words. English interference dissolved these small semi-barbarian semi-civilized communities by blowing up their economical basis and thus produced the greatest and to speak the truth the only social revolution ever heard of in Asia okay so what is what does Marx mean when he says that what is he really doing what he's really saying is that look according to me English rule has been severely disruptive of Indian society. Okay? Nonetheless, it is producing the only kind of social revolution that India, in fact, he uses the phrase Asia, but let's just be a bit more modest, confine ourselves to India, because uh, frankly, I don't know what was really happening in China or Japan or wherever else. Okay? That Marx is saying that nonetheless, Britain is producing a kind of a social revolution because what it's doing is it's cre creating this huge anomie, huge social disorder, unrest. Out of the ashes of that, a new society might possibly emerge. Okay, and why is it that Britain is a necessary agent of change? It's a necessary agent of change because this is, of course, the whole theory of historical determinism that you have to go through. You don't simply go from being a country like India to becoming, you know, in, in the social condition that Marx is describing to becoming a great capitalist engine of growth, right? You have to go through intermediary processes in the middle, steps in the middle, right? And so what uh, uh, England is doing is that England is in fact unwittingly almost, okay, acting as the agent of social change. So here, let's look at the last paragraph over here of this piece. England, it is true in causing a social revolution in Hindustan was actuated only by the vilest interests. So he's very clear. There's nothing noble about what Britain is doing because Britain was animated by the worst possible okay, uh, passions, like greed, essentially. Okay? But nonetheless, there's something valuable, according to Marx in this, in the outcome. So I repeat, England, it is true, in causing a social revolution in Hindustan was actuated only by the vilest interests and was stupid in her manner of enforcing them. But that is not the question. The question is, can mankind fulfill its destiny without a fundamental revolution in the social state of Asia? If not, whatever may have been the crimes of England, she was the unconscious tool of history in bringing about that revolution. Okay, So that's marks for you. You know, and we have to obviously take this analysis seriously, if only because obviously he's the greatest social political commentator of the 19th century, right? And, if, and of course, to a large extent, Indian Marxism was greatly shaped by the kinds of thoughts that Marx had. It's always been a problem what Marx wrote about India for Indian Marxists because they have to try to reconcile you know, their attachment to a certain ideology and then understand how Marx, Marx comes about trying to essentially offer what, for lack of a better phrase, we have to call a defense of colonial rule. Even though he is critical of, of England's own passions, interests, and ambitions, and in fact uses extremely strong language. Right? And just to give you, just to continue with that, uh, I'm not going to look at the next piece in great detail because I think you get pretty much a flavor of what is really at stake here. What I do want to look at, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, by way of an illustration of the kind of question that I think you might want to think about. Uh, for example, in this second piece called The Future Results of the British Rule in India, written just a few weeks after the first piece, he says, I'm going to now conclude my observations that you know, carried over from the previous piece. Right? And in that first long paragraph, he says the following. Okay? India then could not escape the fate of being conquered. And the whole of her past history, if it be anything, is the history 
of the successive conquests she has undergone. And here now comes the critical sentence. Indian society has no history at all. At least no known history. So let's supposing I just gave that to you on the exam and said, what, is that? what does Marx mean when he says Indian right? society has no history at all? At least no known history. Effectively. I mean, I've already answered the question with my remarks before. Right? But, but if I just give, gave, gave this to you as a statement and I said, Marx says India has no history at all, comment. What does he, what does he mean? Right? Because if somebody suggested to you that today, let's say that India is a, is a country that has no history, the argument would seem preposterous. It would seem absolutely bizarre. Right? And by, by the way, by this he does not mean that there's a, there's a distinction to be made because he does not mean by this simply that Indian historians have not bothered to write the history of their own country. Okay, That's not what he's saying. When he says India has no history at all, he's not saying that there are no histories of India. Okay, He's saying Indian society has no history at all. Right? So you know, if you had to write two pages on that, what would you do? Right? And, and that's why that, that's exactly why we've been interested in the question of Orientalism and all the associated ideas for a period of time. Because what Marx is effectively saying here is that look, if you look at if you look at the history of India, okay, this history is only something that appears on the surface. Okay? Why does it have no history? Okay? A, because, because there is infinite fragmentation in this society. And then in the, and then in the you know, preceding piece, he has also talked about the caste system. Okay? There's infinite fragmentation in Indian society. You have a system of village communities, number two, right, which are largely autarkic, so there's really no need for what one might describe as a kind of a dialogue or conversation with the other. Okay? You begin with that. And then you begin, obviously, with Marx's own theory of what is the nature of historical materialism. Right? How does one gravitate from one stage? You move from pre-feudal modes of production to the feudal mode of production, and then you move from there to something called capitalism. And eventually, of course, in Marx's view, you're going to transition, ideally, to a classless society. Right? And of course, before, before India can move to a classless society, it's going to have to, it's going to, have to transition through all of these phases. The only history that India has is a history that comes with the coming of colonial rule. Right? Because of the fact that England is unwittingly an agent of utter social transformation. That you've never really had any kind of social revolution in India before, and you've never had any social revolution in India before, because the template of Indian society remains essentially unchanged. Right? When you say history, you have to have some notion of temporality. You have to have some notion of change through time. What is the notion of temporality in Indian society? Right? So forth and so on. That's exactly what is going to lead Marx to an observation of this kind. Okay, and, and what's interesting, of course, is that, as I said, this is not coming from the point of view of a liberal defender of you know, colonial rule. This is not an Englishman who's saying that, well, look, I want to provide you with all the possible justifications that can possibly be provided for, for colonialism. Right? And Marx is, is quite clear that the English are actuated by, by what he calls the vilest interests. They're motivated by greed, right? And in fact, to some extent, they're not even aware of what they are doing in India, right? To some extent. That's essentially the tenor of the argument that Marx has over here. Okay, so we're not going to look at Marx any further. Uh, I just wanted to give you some idea of how uh, a, a major 19th century social theorist uh, uh, is, is, is interpreting India. Uh, and uh, obviously, you know, 
as I said, there are some interesting consequences, you know, when you begin to look at the work of Indian Marxists. So uh, Irfan Habib, whose uh, book you've been reading, uh, or portions of it, is, is an Indian Marxist uh, as well. That's the approach that he takes. Uh, but he doesn't, he doesn't come entirely from the nationalist school of thought. He's got, he's got a whole critical apparatus for dealing with uh, cl certain claims made by Indian nationalists uh, as well. All right. Now, let me just return very briefly, just a couple more minutes on, to the question of political economy before I wrap up that segment. Right. So let's recapitulate that. Number one, what we find is that India's share of the total manufacturing, world manufacturing, falls dramatically. Okay. Down to 1.4% by 1913 from something as high as over 20%. Uh, 1750, circa 1800. Okay, that's number one. Number two, India's major trading partner, both with respect to imports and exports, is going to be Britain, and that shows you the constraints that India really was not at liberty, so to speak, okay, to be able to trade freely with whoever it might have wanted to do trade with. Okay, and, and that's why the contemporary figure that I gave you, that if you look today at India's great, you know, 15 largest trading partners, you find that Britain is not even in the top 15 of India's major trading partners. And incidentally, even, even in the 1950s, Britain was still, even some years after independence, and now as you can imagine, the largest trading partner is obviously China and the United States, uh, the Gulf states, because India has to import virtually all of its oil. Right? So that's one reason why huge places like Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states are, are, are significant trading partners for India. Okay? Britain does not figure in the top 15 at all. Number three, deindustrialization. Right? Uh, to what extent this deindustrialization took place in India on account of colonial rule, this is a very large subject. I mean, there are people who have devoted their entire lives trying to figure it out. Uh, it's, a, it's a controversial matter. I mean, there are some economists who don't agree with that, uh, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, there is a strand of thought, uh, and that is certainly represented by people like Habib uh, and a whole range of Indian writers from the late 19th century who would have argued that deindustrialization has been a critical factor in trying to understand what happened to India under colonial rule. Right? Fourthly, related to that, what you have is you have a significant decline in the urban population okay, uh, of India. Uh, the urban population of India was extremely low, right? So, for example, from 1881 to 1921, we're talking about a 40-year period, the total urban population of India went up from 9.2% to only 10.1%, a very, very small increase, minuscule increase, okay? And one of the most significant shifts, by the way, in India uh, in the last three decades, again, by contrast, is the hugely increasing urban population of India today. And we're not speaking just about the great metropolises. We're not speaking only about Bombay and Delhi and Bangalore and so forth and so on. We're talking about a large number of cities with population of excess of one million uh, people and more. Okay? And so what you have here is you have a decline of urban crafts. You have a, a decline of the capacity for urban manufacturing. Okay? Uh, and, and again, if you, if you took a complicated economic picture, you find that there might be some, uh, there might be some periods within that when, when you find a slight increase, a slight decrease, but I'm giving you the overall pattern over here. Number five, something we have not talked about at all. Uh, the advent of a railway network in India. So railways are introduced into India in the early 1850s. And so the first line that you're going to find is a line that goes to Thane. Thane is, is a suburb today of, of Bombay. It's part of the greater metropolitan area. And it's a line from the interior, uh, which will, uh, and the, re the reason why they have a line from the interior is it's obviously easier to transport goods, particularly if you're transporting raw goods, right, which are then going to be, you know, t put on a ship, and the ship will then obviously, you know, transport these raw goods uh, to Britain or, or wherever else, right? So what you have is the advent of a railway network beginning with a railway line, as I said, in Western India, one, one that you're going to find uh, in Eastern India as well. By 1900, uh, uh, the railway network is going to be extremely extensive. Uh, India today has one of the largest railway networks in the world. Uh, and very often, 
Uh, this has been mentioned as a great contribution uh, under colonial rule, the advent of railways. Okay? Now, there are lots of interesting things going on. I'm, I can only hint at a few of them. I just want to give you a few illustrations of what are some of the kinds of social changes that are introduced on account of the railways. Number one, the British viewed the railways as a possible way of breaking down caste divisions in Indian society. Okay? Interesting argument if you think about it, right? Um, uh, why caste divisions? Because, you know, something I've spoken to in passing is that if you go by, if you go by the textbook view of caste, there are rigid prohibitions on social encounters between the upper castes and the lower castes in India. And an argument that, that some people would say makes sense even today, uh, or, or that there's certainly evidence to support this kind of rigid separation of the castes. Uh, obviously, in, in urban areas, there's much less of that than there is in rural areas. And one of the reasons why there's more of it in rural areas is that in rural areas, it's hard to escape your identity. Okay. So you know you might be a lower caste person, as I pointed out. Do you remember the whole discussion on status? You might be a lower caste person. Suddenly you win the lottery. You know you win the equivalent of you know a million dollars. You come into a lot of money. Well, you can't simply you can't simply become a higher caste person on account of the fact that you won a lottery. You might be able to acquire a bit more respect, a bit more credibility in your local community. But people know who you are. They know your social origins. Okay, in the rural area. And one of the reasons why the lower caste, uh, the, the theorists of lower caste liberation have always argued for greater urbanization in India is because they feel that the urban area allows the lower caste person, the Dalit, to escape his past, to escape the markers of identity by which he or she is known. Okay? Now, if you go back to the railways, one of the arguments that you find that you encounter frequently in colonial texts and in the observations of European travelers in the middle part of the 19th century, moving into the early part of the 20th century, is that, that when you have a huge number of people moving about, okay, it is likely to break down caste barriers, social divisions between people. Right? So you're all put in a third class cabin. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're a Brahmin or a Shudra or, or a Dalit or a Vaishya or whatever the case might be. Right? If you had to look at it in simple terms. So, so, so the railways, in other words, are not simply a means for physical mobility from point A to point B. They are, in fact, from the point of view of the British, a form of inducing social mobility in India. Social mobility. Okay? One of the arguments that's, that's, that's as I said, qu quite widely prevalent in the literature. Another, another illustration of how the railways may have helped to configure the social and cultural landscape of India. Pilgrimage sites, new pilgrimage sites might arise as a consequence of railways. Okay? Because if you, if you look at the map of India here, okay, uh, one of the ways in which one might define a country is through its pilgrimage sites. You know? So, for example, if you look at the United States, one of the ways in which you might define the United States, you could say that, well, yes, there are the blue states and you know, the red states, uh, which would be a simplification. There's a very recent argument which suggests that there are actually 13 sort of separate countries in the United States. Okay? There's 13 separate identifiable zones in the U.S. All right? I'm not going to go through all of them here, uh, but one way in which you could try to, to define the United States as an illustration, is through its national parks. So you say, okay, you know, so you know, in, in the middle of the country, you have places like uh, Yellowstone. If you go further west, you have Yosemite. You know, you have the Great Smoky Mountains and the national park there, so forth and so on. Right? That might be one way to one way to try to configure the map of the United States. Now, one way in which you would have configured the map of India is through pilgrimage sites. Where do people go when they go on a pilgrimage? Okay. What are the great pilgrimage sites? Now, does the railways alter the pilgrimage map of India? Okay. This, is, this is the kind of question that you could ask yourself when you begin to look at what kinds of transformations were being induced by the coming of the railways into India. 
right? But this is, of course, a very different kind of social and cultural history of the railways because we are on the subject here of political economy, and I was trying to point out to you that an argument has been made that the railways are critical in the economic transformation of India as well. So one of the things that British writers would very often point out um, is the fact that once you had the railways and you had famines in India, it was easy to send food okay, to areas that were famine affected. Now this is how Irfan Habib deals with that argument. Right? So if you look at page, I just want to alert you to the page and you can look it up uh, in detail on your own, on page 82. So page 82 and 83, what he has here is he's got a big table here uh, of famines. Let me just say a word about that before I come to the subject of famines and railways. Right? Uh, and so he gives you a little table. It's called Major Famines, 1858 to 1914. And so if we're trying to perform an autopsy uh, on the uh, uh, economic aspects or effects of British rule in India, uh, this table is a good place to begin. Because if you look at the table very carefully, uh, and this is headlined major famines. Okay? So we're not talking about a famine that took place in a place where you know, 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000 people were killed. Okay? We're talking about casualties of 50,000 or more. Okay, 100,000 or more. Right? So beginning in 1860, Northwest Provinces mortality, estimated number of deaths, 200,000. 1865, Orissa, 1.3 million deaths. Okay? And, and, and you can see it's a full page of, of figures here. And then you get to 1876-78, Madras Presidency, 3.5 million deaths on account of famine. In the Bombay area, 800,000 in the same period. 1877, Northwest Provinces, 1.25 million. Okay? And then, 1896-97, Northwest Provinces, Deccan, okay? Middle India, Southern India. Central Provinces, Punjab, Burma, 4.5 million deaths. Right? So what Habib is trying to show here is that this is an astonishingly horrendous record. Right? An argument that I had suggested to you when I said that British rule in India was book-ended by famines, right? beginning with the, with the conquest of Bengal and the famine that takes place there shortly after, thereafter and going all the way to 1943 when you have what is called the Great Bengal Famine when about 3 million people die in the midst of World War II. Uh, when in fact foodstuffs were being exported from India to places such as Australia to help the Allied war effort although there are people in India who themselves don't have enough food. All right? um, there's a book which I may have mentioned to you before. If I haven't, um, uh, I would certainly like to draw your attention to it right now. It's a book by, by Mike Davis. It's called Late Victorian Holocausts. Uh, and one of the things that Davis uh, discusses in that book is uh, famine mortality in places such as uh, India. He also makes uh, uh, incredible arguments to the effect that, for example, uh, during the Holocaust, when they were trying to determine, okay, when they were trying to determine what was the lowest number of calories that you could give to a person in Auschwitz, because you know Auschwitz was a labor camp, right? You weren't simply sent there and simply sent there to rot away. You know, you actually had to do labor, okay? So it was a labor camp. And so one of, the things, one of the things that the Nazis were interested in doing was trying to figure out what is the lowest minimum number of calories you can give to a person and still expect that person to perform 10 to 14 hours of labor a day. In order to arrive at that figure, the Nazis looked at famine reports in India. Famine reports in India. That's the link. And why did they look at famine reports in India? Because once you had these famines, one of the things that the British tried to do was to introduce what were called public works. So let's say a, let's say a famine takes place in the Madras presidency. Okay? Now you've got a huge number of people right, who don't have access to food. And remember the argument I've given to you before in passing again, that it's not really a matter of access to food. It's a matter of entitlements. Do you even have the money to buy the food, for example? Okay? So why introduce public works? Because what you do is you say, okay, we're going to have a huge irrigation canal built from point A to point B. Let's put 100,000 people to work on this canal. 
right? You p so this is public works, okay? And, and then you say you're going to pay them a certain amount of money, right? You're going to pay them a certain amount of money, or in lieu of that, you're going to give them daily food rations, daily food rations. And so this, so what the British did was they, they came up with these figures, they, you know, after considerable research, you, you know, I mean, it, it's like, for example, a pair of shoes. How long does a pair of shoes last? Well, you have one person wear it constantly and keep on walking until those pair of shoes wear out. Right? The kind of experiments that the Nazis undertook constantly, by the way. Okay? Right? So what, what, the, the Nazis are doing here, according to Mike Davis in this book, Late Victorian Holocaust, is they're actually reading Indian famine reports in substantial detail. Then trying to figure out, okay, how did these people really survive? The ones who survived, that is, on public works. What is the daily calorie intake of a person in the Madras presidency in 1896? And how long? did he survive on, let's say, a daily calorie intake of, let's say, a figure of 1,000 calories, okay? How long could he survive on that? Survive, and, and, not, and, and it's not simply a matter of survival, how long could he continue to perform labor on those 1,000 calories before he dropped dead? For how many days, for how many months, right? So what we are speaking about here, you know, when, when Habib is giving you these figures, you know, these are just cold, bare facts. Now, you have to find a way to put flesh on it, right? And that's what I'm trying to do here. And that's why I'm telling, giving you an anecdote that, you know, once you come up with these figures, you say, ah, the total, you know, famine mortality was 20 million, 40 million. Whatever the figure, it's astronomical, really astronomical. And, and in my view, Certainly a commentary on what exactly were the conditions that colonial rule had produced in India. Now, on the question of famines and railways. So this is what he says, okay? Because he's interested in the question that, you know, that if you're, if you're an apologist for colonial rule, you say that, well, among the great blessings of colonial rule was a railway network, okay? And yes, there's something to be said for the fact that a railway network was introduced and it helped to you know, produce a certain kind of physical mobility. Uh, Mohandas Gandhi, uh, when he writes Hind Swaraj in 1909, is also quite sure that one of the things that the railways did was it also helped to spread epidemics, okay, from one part of the country to another part of the country, right? So there, there are cer certainly different registers in which you can read the whole idea of the railways, right? But this is what he says. The 1868 page 82, 1868-69 famine in the northwest provinces by now well connected by railways, so this area is now well connected by railways, refuted this notion, that is this notion that on account of the railways, supplies would move cheaply from areas where there was a surplus to areas where there was a famine. Okay, that's the notion, that you know, you take, you take food from an area where there's a surplus and send it to an area where there is an acute shortage. And he says that the 1868-69 famine in the northwest provinces refuted this notion. Over half a million died and an official pinpointed the reason. Quote, and I quote, he's quoting from an official English uh, document. While railroads and other means of easy communication lessen the danger of local famine, they widen the area within which high prices prevail. In short, what has been called an artificial dearth is created in districts which would otherwise be happily situated." End quote. And Habib's comment is, by bringing supplies to the core area of the famine, railways did help to restrict the rise of prices there. Right? Because that's the problem, right? That, the, that in a famine, price, the pr price of grain rises so high that you can no longer access it as a common person, right? That's the entitlements issue here. By bringing supplies to the core area of the famine, railways did help to restrict the rise of prices there, but they correspondingly raised prices in areas they had drawn their supplies from, okay? And so the effects of scarcity became more and more widely felt, end quote. 
I, this is not a matter that obviously we are going to be able to resolve. There's a, there's, this is a controversial matter and there's a very substantial amount of literature on this. Um, and with this example of the railways, what I've tried to do is you know, just pinpoint a number of key things that we might want to think about when we're looking at the nature of Indian economy under colonial rule and the economic aspects of the British transformation of India. There's obviously a whole lot more data than one could add to this, but I think that this is where I want to pretty much leave it at. Okay. So are there any, uh, any questions about this uh, particular segment? Teruko, yes. Yeah. And the counterpoint to that is that, sure, it, it connected some things, but yeah. in using famines as an example, they would bring, so let's say area A had a lot of resource or surplus of some yeah. sort, and area B and C may need a There's a dearth. Resource. There's a dearth. Yeah. So, yeah. So you are able to send supplies from A to B, but what it's going to do is it's going to increase prices greatly in area A. And when prices are greatly increased in area A, you no longer have the entitlement, the means to buy food. So therefore, the, the spread of famine is going to become greater. Okay? The spread is going to become much greater. In intensity, in a certain area, it might decrease because supplies have come in. But, but in terms of the spread, that's going to increase. Oh well, you were you were you would you would obviously try to send whatever you could, but there's not enough documentation. For example, about 1770 would be the best illustration. You know, do we really have enough documentation to know how the British dealt with it? I mean, in fact, what I had suggested to you, to the class, when I talked about the 1770 famine, which leads to, as I said, 10 million deaths, is effectively the British didn't do anything. They didn't do anything, and one of the reasons they didn't do anything was that this was a kind of a Malthusian world. You know, so for those of you familiar with the argument of, of Malthus, so this idea was that, look, these people, in a way, are, excess, are, are essentially excess. So if they drop off like flies, let them do that. And, and I have to tell you, by the way, that from, that from my point of view, this is typically how states have looked at their subjects. I mean, the, the most dramatic illustration of that in our times, other than you know, what happened in the Soviet Union with the collectivization of agriculture and the mass famines that occurred in places such as Ukraine is what happened in China 1959 to 1962 when approximately 30 million people died of starvation. 30 million people. And it's not as though the state and its officials did not know what was happening. In fact, there are a huge number of local level reports written by Chinese Communist Party officials saying we've got a real problem here going on in this area, the report goes up to the top and they simply ignore it. Because this is one way of obviously in which you regulate your populations, you see, right? So that's a short answer to, to the question that you've posed. Any other comments or, or uh, observations that anybody has before we now uh, move to the next segment? Yes. Yeah. Um, you talked about how it would allow um, like more social mobility. Why would the British be concerned with that? Like why would, oh, they're concerned with that because they, they believe that caste is the most backward in social institution in the world. Okay, so they were actively trying to get rid of caste? Well, I don't know that they're actively trying to get rid of caste. I mean, how does one get rid of caste? In fact, actually, one can make the opposite argument. Uh, which, which uh, you know, we're not doing the, the reading really for that. And, that. and that argument is an argument to the effect that, in fact, under the British, in, the institution of caste became much more rigid, that it had never been that rigid, right? So your question is, is a very good question. You're saying that there might be a tension there that, on the one hand, you know, the, the actions that the British are undertaking, such as the census, for example, what it's doing is it's going to make caste distinctions more rigid. On the other hand, some of them are saying, ah, look, one of the, f one of the benefits, and I, I didn't say, by the way, that this is the only two. I just gave illustrations, okay, of what are some of the kinds of reasonings that are taking place in, in British circles about what good are the railways going to do. 
why, why introduce the railways, okay? And obviously there are economic arguments for that. The economic arguments have to do with expansion of trade, expansion of uh, uh, British, uh, uh, you know, facilities, right? So you can, you can bring in material from the interior much more quickly to the port, and then from the port you can transport it to England, so forth and so on, right? There are those kinds of arguments. But, but on the other hand, the British are certainly thinking to themselves that we are here. Look, think about Marx's piece, that we are the agents of social transformation. Some of this is not conscious, some of it is quite unconscious, and some of it is quite unwittingly done, right? But, but obviously among some British officials there is this idea that, well, you know, we have to effectively transform this society. Right? And so the railways from their point of view are an interesting way to break down the kinds of social barriers which from their point of view have, are deeply encrusted in Indian society. And nothing more so than the caste system. Right? Because, because the scenario I, I raised for you is a scenario where, you know, a hundred people are traveling on a third class cabin. And among those hundreds, there might be Brahmins, there might be Shudras. No, from the British point of view, this is the breakdown of all of the taboos that have held together the caste system. You know. But of course, you know, there's a great many things that they are thinking about too. You know, so, you know, why, why build a railway line all the way up to Shimla? Right, Shimla is that hill station that I've spoken to you about. I mean, clearly they have their own interests in mind too. This is not simply dictated by pure altruism on their part. Ah, you know, we're here, we're going to bring the benefits of modern technology to the Indians. And that's why I've given you that quotation from Irfan Abi because it crystallizes one central, simply by way of an illustration, one central problem. And that is that the, the argument that would be given quite often would be that what the railways do is they help alleviate the distress of famines. And he's saying that may not be so. It's much more complicated. I mean, I remember, you know, I have a, a, a book that I had chanced upon 25 years ago, uh, which I still have in my collection. It's called India Land of the Black Pagoda. God knows what the Black Pagoda is because I've never heard India described that way before. But anyhow, that's the title of the book. And if you look at the illustration, so there's this photograph in this book, okay, and it shows two boys uh, on the same page. One is a boy uh, who's shown as extremely skinny, extremely skinny, and you can see the bones sticking out. Okay, and then the caption says, this is a, this is a photograph of a boy uh, in the Madras presidency where famine has struck, something to that effect. Okay, and then on the right hand side is a picture of a boy who's shown as very plump. Okay, and then the caption says, this is an illustration of a boy in a different part of the Madras presidency who was rescued at, on account of the food that was transported by the trains to his village or whatever town. Right? That's a caption, effectively. Right? And so, you know, th this is obviously something that they are thinking to themselves, you know, that if you have to project a certain conception of your own rule, nothing better than the railways. Right? That this is something that unifies a country. You know, we haven't even spoken about all the ideological arguments. The ideological arguments are to the fact that, well, India isn't one country to begin with. That there never was any country called India before we came along. Right? We are going to unify this country. And what best unifies a country is the railway network. Right? It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a kind of argument that, that at the ideological plane also applies to the English language. You know, they, you, these have to be seen as things that complement each other, right? And that's, as I said, if you had to do a, a very detailed kind of social cultural history of the railways in India, then you would have to include all of that, you know? And you'd have to include a great many things that we, we obviously cannot even ven venture into, such as how do the reading habits of people change when the railways come in. You've got train journeys. I myself have been on a train journey in India that lasted 60 hours. Now, if you're on a train for 60 hours, you know, you, 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 you know, and this is 25 years ago, this is before the iPad age and all of that, well, you better be armed with a few books, you know, and you read. That's what you do. So, so when you begin to do the social history of such institutions, there are things that come to mind that you would never think of. And, and I would be willing to wager anything 
that if you did the social history of the railways in any country in the world, you would find that the reading habits of people change when they travel by train on a regular basis. You know? But that's not the sort of thing we would think about. We would simply think about, ah, you know, the railways are used to transport people from point A to point B or goods from point A to point B. And then, of course, you can do a thriller like an Agatha Christie thriller, you know, murder on the Orient Express kind of. You can add a different kind of cultural element, you know, to that, right? So if you did the social history, it would intersect, I think, of the railways. It would intersect with various aspects of the economic and cultural landscape of India as well. Okay. Um, now let me move to um, the rebellion. But before I do so, let's refresh your memory about where we were with respect to the political situation in India, right? So you ha might recall, um, and you know, Marx, as I said, is a good point of transition. These pieces are written in 1853. So this is just four years before the rebellion, and he's going to write a number of dispatches on the rebellion as well. And at the point at which I had stopped my dis discussion of the political history, what I'd been describing for you was um, a number of things. One, the fact that uh, by the 1840s, the Sikh kingdom over here in the Punjab, this has now been incorporated into British India. Okay? Uh, the Sikhs, there are going to be these Anglo-Sikh wars, which are going to take place a few years after the death of Ranjit Singh in 1839. Uh, and by the early 1850s, uh, the Punjab is part of British India. And I was suggesting to you that, you know, that if you look at the first 50 to, 50 to 80 years, what you really find is attempts to be able to control uh, what we might describe as the interior, the central provinces, parts of South India, obviously Bengal over here in the east. But then when you get into the 1820s and after, moving into the 1850s, most of this expansion is going to be at the extremity. So you have the Anglo-Sikh wars, you have the Anglo-Burmese wars, and then you have the annexation of Sindh here in Western India, okay, the 1840s and 1850s. The second factor I'd mentioned to you was the fact that uh, what you have is uh, uh, this, this doctrine of the paramount power, okay, that the British view themselves as a paramount power, and I'm not going to describe it in now because we've already gone over it, uh, but this is going to be an argument that is going to be used to be able to annex Indian states, right? A large number of Indian states are going to be annexed. 1848, the state of Satara, just giving you a list. 1858, the state of Bhagat, a small state. It's a Punjab hill state. 1852, Udaipur. 1853, Jhansi. 1854, Nagpur. 1856, Avad. Okay, six prominent cases of annexation that are going to take place. All right, 1853, the railways start. So now, think of everything. The telegraph line comes into India, 1851. The postal system comes into in India, 1851. All right, so great many things are now coming together. You've got various kinds of technological advancements. If we could, obviously, t you know, the telegraph line and the railways un unquestionably. Communication networks have become better because now you have a postal system, okay? Uh, the extremities of India's borders are now under control, so to speak, right? Those are the conditions that we're really talking about. And then you have got the doctrine of the paramount power, you've got the doctrine of lapse. So remember that if a, if a ruler does not have a natural biological heir to the throne, right, that it, that the, the kingdom would lapse, right? So Dalhousie is the governor general of India uh, at this point in time. Uh, uh, I, think his, I think his years were 1848 to 1856. So about eight years uh, he served as a governor general of India. He's going to be replaced by a man called Canning, all right? And uh, Dalhousie is very clear that when heirs and successors are mentioned, right, this means natural heirs not adopted. Right? And, and one, of, one of the East India Company officials, his name is Sir John Hobhouse, this is what he says, quote, I have a very strong opinion that on the death of the present prince, he's talking about a particular state, without a son, that on the death of the present prince without a son, no adoption should be permitted. And this petty principality should be merged in the British Empire. 
All right? So that's the doctrine of lapse. Those are the conditions that we are speaking about which are eventually going to lead to the rebellion of 1857-1858. So what is the rebellion? Okay, and, and I'm, I'm going to give you a full-blown account of the other things that contributed to it as well because what you have at this point is an incomplete sketch. But let's first be clear about what we mean when we speak about the rebellion. So what you have is the company, and the company has armies. And it has three main armies. It's, it's the Bengal army, the Madras army, and the Bombay army. Okay? The rebellion is going to be foremost in the ranks of the Bengal army. It used to be called mutiny. That was, that was the, the Sepoy mutiny. If you look at older works on the rebellion of 1857-58, it's always called the Sepoy mutiny. Let me tell you what the word Sepoy is. Sepoy is from the word Sipai, which means foot soldier, a foot soldier, okay? As somebody who is in the lower ranks, you know, okay, of the infantry, usually. Now, the word mutiny fell into disrespect among uh, nationalist historians. One of the reasons it, it, uh, it, it, it was not favored at all is that when you call, call it a mutiny, it suggests that British rule was legitimate and that the soldiers then mutinied. Okay? And of course, there's a question about whether one ought to view British rule in India as legitimate at all, especially if you are arguing from the nationalist standpoint. All right? So that's a, a very short history as to why the phrase, the rebellion of 1857-58, uh, there's an Indian historian, by the way, who calls it the first Indian war of independence. He's thinking of the American war of independence, so he's, he's saying that this is something on a similar scale. Okay? Um, uh, Vinayak Savarkar, you know, he's the person who writes his book with the first Indian War of Independence, which is how he characterizes the events of 1857-58. So the mutiny or the rebellion is going, to, is going to occur in the ranks of the Bengal army principally. What is going to happen? And what is the immediate catalyst? The conventional narrative says the following, that the British army had introduced a new rifle, a new Enfield rifle, and before you could load a cartridge into this rifle, you had to bite off a portion of the top. Okay, this, this cartridge is greased with either cow fat or pig fat. Okay, that's a conventional narrative. And so these soldiers say that, hey, this is, this is something that really insults our native sentiments because if you're a Hindu, Okay, contact with, you know, and if you're an observant Hindu, shall we say, it's a diff difficult category because, uh, you know, uh, one can't speak an observant Hindu in the same way as one speaks of an observant Christian, for example. Okay, but you're using it for the sake of convenience. Then let's say that you're an orthodox Hindu, you're a believing Hindu. Uh, contact with, with cow fat is polluting, contaminating. For a Muslim, contact with pig fat is contaminating, polluting. Okay, so this is supposed to be the immediate catalyst that the soldiers were deeply offended by the fact that they now became contaminated as a consequence of this new rifle that's introduced. Now, some historians have pointed out that once a company realized that, hey, you know, it's committed an egregious error, it immediately recalled all of the, the rifles. And so according to some historians, this cannot really be advanced as an argument for why the rebellion eventually took place. Okay. So what's going to happen is that there's going to be a regiment which is going to declare a rebellion in the city of Meerut. Okay, so Meerut is uh, approximately, let's say, two hours from Delhi, a few hours from Delhi. All right. Um, these people, led by a sepoy by the name of Mangal Pandey, and there is a Hindi feature film called Mangal Pandey. You might want to take a look at that. It's actually quite an interesting film. Uh, I don't think Netflix has it, but you should be able to find it from some other source. Uh, so it, it's a film called Mangal Pandey. It's a very long film, and it bas basically tries to recreate what happened in 1857 uh, and looks at, looks at some of this history from below, okay, from the point of view of some of these sepoys. Uh, one fundamental problem you have to think about immediately is what are our sources for the study 
of the rebellion of 1857-1858. The vast majority of the sources are British. And many of these sources are British officials, both, both civilian officials and army officials, who were charged with putting down the rebellion. So you have a British official who's posted in Meerut, you know, witnesses what's happening, and in his diary he's going to write down what happened. That's the source. And so the, what is the problem? The problem, you know, an interesting historical problem, problem for students of history, which is what all of you are, at least tentatively in this room, you know, right? And that is a problem. How do you study history from the point of view of the, of the sepoys? when all the sources that you have are coming from the top. Okay? And they, of course, these are not the only sources. I mean, then there are official histories. So for example, there's this official history of the Sepoy mutiny. It's in six volumes by Kay and Mallison. Six huge volumes. It's the official history. Okay, but this is a history written from the point of view of British military officials. Right? And, th and that's a problem that we're going to have to think about because when we say, ah, this is what, Ma what Mangal Pandey did, okay, do we have a diary left behind by Mangal Pandey or by some of his other, you know, friends in the regiment, for example? Right? That's the kind of question you'd have to ask. And the, the, the brute fact of the matter is there are virtually no sources from the bottom. Very, very few. And one of the things the Indian government has tried to do over the years is obviously collect some of these sources, okay? So let me just one more minute and just, just let you know what, what happens with this and then we'll continue with the narrative. So they decide to rebel, Mangal Pandey. And what do they do? They march to Delhi. Why do they march to Delhi? It's, it's not the capital of British India, no. Who's, who's in Delhi? The Mughal emperor, the, the, this, this man is still around. You know, he's still there. Okay, he's now 80 years old. He's almost senile, by the way. Okay, and he's sitting there, and these mutineers go up to the Mughal emperor, Badr Shah Zafar, and what do they say? Will you become the leader of this rebellion? Will you become the leader of this rebellion? Okay, so on that note, I'm going to end. We'll take up the story from here and look into some of the reasons for the mutiny and what were the outcomes of the rebellion of 1857.